right after Shirley had, but he finally had succumbed to his injuries and passed away. Dave's last-ditch maneuver had worked. He had saved Shirley's life at the cost of his own. However, not long after Shirley and her family found out about Dave's death, they got another call, and this time it was to tell them that the news about Dave's death was premature. He was not dead. However, he was paralyzed from the neck down. A few weeks later, after Shirley got out of the hospital, she immediately went to the intensive care unit where Dave was being treated to see him for the first time since their accident. And when she saw him, he was sitting in a wheelchair covered in tubes and wires, and she just stood there looking at him, and Dave, when he saw Shirley, he just started to cry. At this point, Shirley walked up to him, she gave him a hug, and she said, I love you. Uh -huh. Today, Dave and Shirley are still friends. Shirley has recovered completely because of Dave's heroic act. Dave, on the other hand, remains paralyzed and only has a little bit of feeling in his right arm. He now lives in Texas with his mother, who looks after him full time, and they desperately need our support. My family has already made a donation to his GoFundMe page, and I hope some of you will do the same thing. You can find his GoFundMe page in the description below, and after speaking with him, he assured me that all of the donation money is being used to take care of himself. He has a lot of care that he needs, his mom can't do it alone, and so anything we give them is just making his life a little bit easier. I always tell my oldest daughter to do things that scare her because oftentimes those are the things we actually want to do the most. And so today I'm going to live up to what I always tell my kid to do because today I'm announcing my first ever live storytelling show. Doing a live event has always been so interesting to me, but it's actually just kind of terrified me. And so I got to do it. It's going to be a digital live experience on February 16th, so roughly two weeks from now. And because it's so close to Valentine's Day, we decided to call this show the Valentine's Day Show. And this one hour long show will just be me at my desk with no script, telling you crazy, strange, dark, and mysterious stories in real time. If this first show goes really well and people enjoy it, they want more of it, then I think there's a real chance we transition to a full-scale tour where maybe I could be telling live stories in campgrounds or in locations where some of these stories have taken place. We don't know yet, but it all starts with this first show. So to show your support and to tell us that you want a live tour, go get your tickets now. There's even some really cool special limited edition Valentine's Day merch that you can get as part of a ticket bundle. Also, I'll be doing a live Q&A after the show that you can get a pass to as well. Go to moment.co slash Mr. Ballin to get your tickets, to get your merch, to get your after party passes. Again, that's moment.co slash Mr. Ballin. Happy Valentine's Day. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and replace their cat with an identical looking cat. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We now have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast that puts out brand new podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And on Thursday mornings, we put up the remastered audio of our best YouTube videos. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music. We have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts. The other is called Mr. Ballin in Espanol. We post near daily content on TikTok, Facebook, and Snapchat. All of those pages are just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Check out our merch at shopmrballin.com, and if you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support, and until next time, that's going to do it. See you.
How's it going? Hey, pay attention to me. You're not paying attention to me. I need you to focus. Because if you don't know, my name is Bailey Sarian. And right now you are listening to my podcast, which is called Dark History. And if you're like, what's this? I've never heard of Valentine's Day is supposed to be a day. Here are six vicious Valentine's Day murders. In Macomb County, Michigan, a seemingly normal family man named Stephen Grant had a nice home, lovely wife, and two kids. But the horrific crime Stephen committed was anything but normal. On Valentine's Day 2007, Stephen called the local sheriff's office to report his wife missing. He says his wife, 34-year-old Tara Grant, was seen leaving the house in a dark-colored car that he didn't recognize after the two had gotten into an argument. The reason Stephen waited so long to report her missing is because Tara worked five days a week in Puerto Rico and would commute back home on the weekends. Stephen had tried calling Tara and left messages voicing his concern. But days after not hearing from her, he knew something was wrong. He even reached out to the local news, pleading with the public to help find Tara. Call anybody. Call the police. Call me. And let's call someone. But those were all fake tears. Stephen was the only one that knew that Tara was already dead. Stephen was the detective's top suspect. And when a woman was going for a jog in Stony Creek Metro Park, only walking distance from Stephen's home, she found a Ziploc bag with bloody gloves and metal shavings inside. This prompted investigators to perform a search warrant on Stephen's home on March 2nd. Stephen knew the gig was up at this point. Before police discovered any evidence, and Stephen not being under arrest yet, Stephen said he was going out for a walk while the home was being combed through top to bottom. And in the garage, in a storage bin, wrapped in a garbage bag, police found the hacked-up torso of Tara Grant. Pushing past the gruesome discovery you think only happens in movies, Police go to arrest Stephen for the murder of his wife, but Stephen cannot be found. They let him slip away, and the search was on for a savage killer. Stephen borrowed a French truck from down the street. Once he made a call from his cell phone, they discovered his location. Police found Stephen 225 miles away in Wilderness State Park in northern Michigan. He was out in the snow nearly frozen to death. Stephen was airlifted to Northern Michigan Hospital for hypothermia. After a couple of days and reaching stable condition, Stephen confessed to everything. Stephen says him and Tara were arguing about her crazy work schedule. The dispute quickly escalated. Tara slaps Stephen across the face. Stephen retaliates and hits her back. She fell and she banged back her head on the floor and she said something like, Overwhelmed with anger, Stephen does the unthinkable. She Perfect. finally grabbed my hand at one point, it was too late. Stop. I know it's okay. Stephen then ties a belt around Tara's neck and drags her downstairs into his SUV where the next morning he would take Tara's lifeless body to his father's metal shop to commit another heinous act in hopes to cover up his crime by using tools at the shop to dismember her body. And Tara's hand up. Cut the next joint. The next joint. Same with her leg. And sometimes threw up. Um, I threw up again. Stephen then took pieces of Tara and hid them throughout Stony Creek Metro Park. But Tara's torso was too big to hide, which is why it was left in Stephen's garage. Police spent days searching the park looking for pieces of Tara. Prosecutors believe Stephen was motivated by his desire to be with their family live-in nanny from Germany, 19-year-old Verena, but no concrete evidence was found. 
On December 21st, 2007, Stephen Grant was found guilty of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 50 years. The entire Grant family was torn apart, including Stephen's father, William Grant. On June 13th, 2008, he committed suicide, overtaken by immense grief and pain that someone that he raised could commit such an atrocity. Since Tara's death, there has been an annual Tara Grant Memorial 5K walk to raise awareness for domestic abuse and help those that are in need. The most well-known case on this list involves Oscar Pistorius. He was born with a congenital defect, and before his first birthday, doctors were forced to amputate both his feet. Fitted with prosthetics, he was fortunate to live a normal life, actually even better than normal. Fitted with these blade-style limbs, he was able to compete at the highest level on the track. The peak of his fame was in 2012, where he qualified to complete in the London Olympic Games for his home country of South Africa. It wasn't so much the time that he could run that brought him all the attention, but a topic of controversy. People debated if it gave him an unfair advantage or not. Pistorius didn't meddle, but he was offered a number of endorsements, such as Nike, for all his notoriety. But his beloved underdog story took a turn for the worst. On Valentine's Day 2013, Pistorius and his model girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, went to bed at 10 p.m. Around midnight, Pistorius heard what he believed to be an intruder from downstairs. He went to investigate with his pistol in hand. He saw that the bathroom door was closed and could hear noises coming from inside. Pistorius' next move was the worst decision of his life. He fired four shots into the bathroom door, not knowing what was on the other side. He then put on his prosthetics and broke down the locked door. And when he did, he discovered that he had shot and killed his own girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. The story made headlines across the world. The once beloved athlete now facing murder charges. Pistorius says he didn't hear Reva get out of bed to use the restroom, nor did he notice she was no longer in the bedroom. Whether you believe his story or not, firing a gun through a door, not knowing what's on the other side, was reckless behavior. But that's what the courts were going to decide. In October of 2014, Oscar Pistorius was found guilty of culpable homicide and reckless endangerment with a firearm and was sentenced to 12 years in prison and will be eligible parole in 2023. To this day, Pistorius believed that it was an intruder inside his home and he never meant to kill Reva. Whether that is true or not, his deed didn't go without punishment. Unfortunately, we will never hear Reva's side of the story. 2010, 36-year-old Stacy Sheck was a mother of three and on her fifth husband, Richard Sheck. It was Valentine's Day and the two had a romantic tradition of exchanging Valentine's cards at a nearby Belton Bridge Park. Richard arrived at the park first, but when Stacy showed up, Richard was on the ground next to his truck, dead, with a gunshot to the head. Detectives didn't have much to go on, except for the set of tire prints that were at the scene. The orange set is that of Richard's, and the blue set is the possible suspects. The entire thing seemed very unusual. Richard still had all his money and wallet on him. If robbery wasn't the motive, then what was? A deep look into Stacy answered that question. Stacy had a great job at the Cobb Medical Center in Georgia, and some company emails revealed the trail of payments to a subordinate of Stacy's named Lanita Ross. And those payments were under the disguise of house repairs. But really, the money was to give to her boyfriend, Reginald Coleman, who agreed to kill Richard Sheck for roughly $10,000. And what was Lenitra's reward, you ask? Free rent from Stacy. Lenitra rented one of the homes that Stacy owned. Plus, Stacy promised to give the couple her parent's Chevy Impala, the same car that Reginald used to commit the murder. Detectives examined the tires on the car and found a perfect match for the ones at the crime scene. Once confronted with all the evidence, Stacy confessed to it all, along with the help of Lenitra and Reginald. It was supposed to be a robbery. That's what he had said. It was supposed to be one shot to the head. I said, I don't want him to suffer. I don't want him to see anything. Police also looked into Stacy's boyfriend, Juan, as she was hiding from Richard, but excluded him from participating. So why would Stacy do all this? 
She had half a million reasons through a recent life insurance policy that she purchased. She said she didn't want to go through another divorce. Richard Sheck was just another husband to Stacy. In the end, justice was served, and all three received life in prison. 25-year-old Tiana Nolis was a very bright, gregarious girl. She had a great job. Communications at the University of Hartford. Everything was going great in her life. That was until she met James Carter. They started dating, and he seemed to be a good fit for her at first. But in the middle of their relationship, James was arrested and sentenced to five months in jail for domestic abuse against a former girlfriend of his. This showed Tiana that James wasn't exactly who he said he was. He had a history of anger and violence. So Tiana filed a restraining order on him. In return, James filed a restraining order on Tiana. She really didn't care about that, as long as James would stay out of her life. But he didn't. James became obsessed with Tiana. He called and texted her constantly, even following her around town running errands. This obviously violated the restraining order. But when Tiana went to local police to show them that James was still harassing her, they didn't seem to care. Time and time again, nothing was done. Tiana's mother claimed that she went to the police department 33 times in a six-week span in hopes to get James arrested, but to no avail. On Valentine's Day 2009, Tiana left her apartment and saw a note that was left on her front door that read, Tiana, forgive me. I never cheated on you. If I'm lying... May God take my life. Forgive me for everything else that I've done. Tiana then did what she always did and took this note to the police station, knowing it was from James. Again, police didn't arrest him, but rather they called James and told him not to do stuff like this because the next time he will be arrested. This infuriated James. So later that day, James waited for Tiana to come home. And when she did, he followed her to the front door of her apartment and stabbed her over and over again. James quickly fled the scene, and Tiana called police on her cell phone after being stabbed with a neighbor by her side. Oh! I'm bleeding to death! Where are you? I'm bleeding to death! Where are you? I'm bleeding to death! Where are you? I'm bleeding to death! Who's there with you? Mm. Who's there with you? Mm. Where are you? You're not gonna die. You're not gonna die. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, her neighbor was wrong. Tiana bled out right there. James was swiftly apprehended and confessed to what he did and received 60 years in prison. Hopefully, that's for the rest of his life. That 911 tape is hard to listen to. Tiana's family mourned her death, but also pointed out that it should never have happened. James constantly violated his restraining order. Tiana showed the police evidence of him doing so, but nothing was ever done. James should have been in jail and never had a chance to kill Tiana. The Plainville and Waterbury Police Departments were found to be grossly negligent and guilty in a wrongful death suit and ordered to pay $10 million to Tiana's family. From this money, the Tiana Angelique Notice Foundation was formed to help strengthen laws against domestic violence and stalking. Tiana took all the proper steps to have the system work in her favor, but it failed her. Valentine's Day, 2013, Peoria, Illinois, a 41-year-old missionary man named Nathan Luthol came home and noticed that there was a break-in, broken windows in the house completely ransacked, but the most horrific part, his wife on the floor, lifeless in a pool of blood. She was shot in the back of the head. At first, it appeared to be a robbery gone wrong. Maybe the home was being robbed, and Denise came home in the middle of it, spooked the burglars, and paid the ultimate price. But as detectives looked closer at the crime scene, it didn't appear to be natural. They suspected the robbery part to be staged. That's when investigators zoned in on the husband, Nathan. Nathan and Denise had two kids together, and also sponsored a 21-year-old foreign exchange student from Lithuania named Ina. There were whispers of Nathan having a romantic affair with Ina, buying her clothes, and paying for spa treatments. This seemed to be things only one would pay for if you're in a relationship. These suspicions only grew stronger as detectives read notes written by Denise suspecting Nathan of infidelity. The most alarming is when addressing it to Nathan, she wrote, 
I know you want me dead. Police obtained a subpoena for Nathan's phone and computer. Not only did they find 30 messages between Nathan and Ina, but on Nathan's Google search, they found the searches for best way to kill someone, how to muzzle a gunshot, and lethal injection. That may not be a smoking gun, but possibly the brightest red flag possible. Also, the 40 caliber shell casing that was found next to Denise was the same caliber of weapon that Nathan owned, but reported missing a couple weeks prior to the murder. A very convenient thing to happen so detectives can't compare ballistics. With enough circumstantial evidence to arrest Nathan, they did, and charged him with first degree murder. A jury of his peers heard the arguments and deliberated, and ultimately came back with a guilty verdict. Nathan was sentenced to 80 years in prison. You might think Ina could have been a part of the plot as well, but charges were never filed, and it was just Nathan that will be rotting away for the rest of his life. 1993, San Bernardino County. A 29-year-old, Ignacia Manriquez, had three kids with Juan Manuel Navarro. The couple's relationship had soured, and Ignacia had filed for a restraining order against Juan. Juan became very angry and bitter towards the whole situation. And on Valentine's of that year, Juan Navarro did the unimaginable. Ignacia was taking her four-year-old little Juan <laughs> to the Loma Linda University Medical Center due to experiencing flu-like symptoms. Once arriving in the parking lot, Juan Navarro had followed her and surprised Ignacia with a gun in his hand. A witness named Bradford Montgomery described what happened next. As he wrestled her out of that truck and just basically dragged her down and without looking around or anything, just right under and fired and grabbed her by the back of the neck as he pulled her out and fired. Juan Navarro then takes little Juan with him and drives away. Mr. Montgomery follows the vehicle, but loses track of him, but not before he gets a description of the car and a partial license plate to give to police once he returns back to the crime scene. Police were on the search for Juan Navarro and his son. 19 days after the murder, little Juan was returned to his grandma's house, but Juan Navarro fled again. Little Juan described what happened that day by saying that Daddy shot Mommy and there was ketchup everywhere. It was later discovered that Juan Navarro was hiding out at a ranch content and some graphic violence as such listener discretion is advised 
But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right podcast because that's what we do. And we upload twice a week, once on Monday and once on Thursday. So if that's of interest to you, please remove the pressure plate from underneath the five-star review button's enter key on their keyboard. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Bowen podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. For 19-year-old Lisa Stasi, the Christmas of 1984 was the worst she could remember. And that was really saying something, because even though Lisa was still very young, she had been through a lot. Born in the city of Huntsville, Alabama, whose 143,000 residents lived in the northernmost part of the state, best known as the Heart of Dixie, Lisa's father had died when she was just a child, and her brother would commit suicide. And so, after dropping out of high school at the age of 17, the beautiful teenager with the bright smile decided to leave Huntsville, her broken family, and her sad memories behind, and head for the metropolitan glamour and polish of Kansas City, Kansas, 670 miles to the northwest. But two years after that great escape, here she was, in the middle of a cold Midwest winter, in the middle of a collapsed marriage that had lasted only one year. In many ways, Lisa was worse off now than she'd been back in Alabama. She had no money, she had no job skills, and she had no home. But the one thing Lisa did have that made her happier than anything else in her life was her tiny four-month-old daughter, Tiffany. Back when Lisa had arrived in Kansas City in 1983 and met her future husband, Carl, at a bar, she hadn't intended to get pregnant, but shortly after being introduced to the handsome 23-year-old sailor, The two of them had fallen in love, and the rest, as Lisa's mother would say, was history. Just one month after the young couple got married in August of 1984, little Tiffany Lynn was born on September 4th at a hospital on the Missouri side of Kansas City. But right after that, things started going downhill. By October, Carl was out of the Navy and out of work, and according to Lisa's friends and family, their marriage had turned violent. Two months later, just a few days after Christmas, Carl would leave Lisa and Tiffany, and he would rejoin the military. With nowhere to go, Lisa and her baby moved into Hope House, which was a local shelter for homeless women. But just one month after that horrible Christmas, Lisa got the break she had been praying for. In the beginning of January 1985, the director of Hope House told Lisa that a local philanthropist had contacted the shelter, saying that his newly founded charitable organization, called Kansas City Outreach, had heard about Lisa's plight and wanted to help her. Kansas City Outreach looked specifically for mothers with infants who needed housing and job training, and so Lisa was a perfect fit. Through their program, Lisa would be given her own furnished apartment and an $800 monthly allowance, along with some babysitting money. Lisa was thrilled. A few days after learning about this program and agreeing to be a part of it, Lisa had packed up all of her belongings and she had driven to her sister-in-law's house, where someone from the program was going to come and pick Lisa and her baby up and take them to their new apartment. As Lisa waited, she felt annoyed that her sister-in-law, Kathy, was not as excited about this opportunity as she was. In fact, Kathy was acting like this whole thing seemed kind of sketchy, that the Kansas City Outreach Program was just too good to be true. And as a heavy snowstorm moved into the area that day, Kathy suggested in a hopeful voice that maybe the weather would keep her ride from being able to drive out to pick her up that day and that maybe Lisa would have another day or two to decide if she really wanted to go through with this. But Lisa shrugged her off, and a little while later, right at the appointed hour, the two women heard a knock on the front door. And when they opened it, to their surprise, the founder of the Kansas City Outreach Program was there. He was a smiling, well-dressed, middle-aged man in a long trench coat. And after introducing himself, he walked back to the car and stood there, ready to open the car door for Lisa. Lisa carefully wrapped her baby, Tiffany, in her warmest blanket and tucked her into the car seat that was sitting near the front door. Then Lisa said goodbye to her sister-in-law, and then she picked up the car seat and shielded Tiffany from the snow as she walked quickly down the front steps and out to the waiting car. She strapped her infant into the back seat, then Lisa slid into the front passenger seat where she buckled up and then waved and smiled at Kathy as the car pulled away from the curb. 
Over the next several weeks, Lisa, who normally spoke with her mother all the time, stopped calling. Concerned, Lisa's mother contacted the Kansas City Police, and the police asked her if, besides phone calls, had she had any other interactions with her daughter recently, and Lisa's mother would hesitate, but would say, yes, she had. Not long after Lisa's calls had stopped, Lisa's mother had received a typewritten note from Lisa that had her daughter's signature written out at the bottom that claimed Lisa was doing just fine and that she didn't need anything, but there was just something odd about the way the note was written. It just didn't sound like Lisa at all. Eight years later, in 1993, a 48-year-old woman named Beverly Bonner stood looking around the prison library at the Western Missouri Correctional Center in Cameron, a little town of 8,500 residents located in the northwest corner of Missouri. When Beverly had gotten her advanced degrees in teaching and librarianship back in college, she had never expected to find herself in charge of a prison library, especially after spending more than a decade as an executive with the Mobile Oil Company back in the 1970s and 80s in Kansas City. But a lot had changed for Beverly over the last 20 years. She'd had two children and had gone through one divorce before marrying her current husband, who happened to be the prison doctor at the Western Missouri Correctional Center. Beverly was grateful that she'd been hired as the prison librarian, but as she looked around at the perfectly organized collection of books on the shelves, she wished that her job was a little more challenging and that her marriage to Dr. William, now in its sixth year, was a little bit more exciting. Except that recently, very recently, Beverly's life had gotten a little bit more interesting. As she heard the metal door into the library open, Beverly felt her pulse quicken. She knew it was her new library assistant, a prison inmate whose exemplary behavior and high level of education had qualified him for this plum assignment inside.